Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Alan Rudy, and I am moderator. This is uh, Tuesday, April 5th. Uh, issues that matter in this election. Uh, it is number 2162. Welcome. As many of you probably know by now, or at least those who have attended sessions in this room, 235, um, we have a new process for asking, asking questions, which is to text questions uh, to the moderator. Uh, the good news and the bad news is it has worked wonderfully well throughout uh, the conference. It's uh, an experiment, and we're trying to make it work. And the bad news is it's not working. <laughs> It may be in a moment, though, so hold on, hold on for a second. Okay, we'll, we'll take a shot. Well, we're, we're going to take a shot. Um, on each side, thank you, on, on each side of the stage uh, are boards uh, that have the number to which you should, you should put in and text that number, which is 22333 and then send it a message, which in this case is U-M-C-G-M-B. Uh, after you have done that, uh, it will ask you to confirm that you're on and, and you will be on and you will be able to communicate. Uh, you can do that throughout this whole session. Uh, this session is being live streamed uh, around the world, so somebody in Italy might have a question in the middle of it and be able to ask it also. Uh, should you not have a phone, uh, there will be folks on the aisle with cards uh, and pencils that will give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions anyway. Uh, there's another feature uh, for those of you who have the app, which is really wonderful. Uh, on the app, on the top right-hand corner of the app, it allows you to check into the meeting. It lets us know that you're here. And on the left side of it, you will see five stars. Uh, those stars allow you to grade the session uh, so that if, if you like it a whole lot, you can light up all five of them. And if you like it less, don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it is not working? OK, John, are you still here? It's not working. When it works, it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yours is working? Wait a minute, I'm looking to see. Yeah, I see, hi, Alan, from John. That, that happens. <laughs> They're getting a message. Keep Can getting messages. Keep but no, but I told you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, did everybody try, uh, who's attempting Go ahead, yeah, get on, and then register as it asks you to do. Are you doing? Are you are you on? We can hear you. Why don't you try? <laughs> so if you were. <laughs> We're gonna pass out index cards. Okay, I'm saying I'm saying that people are are getting on. Okay, I'm gonna go. We're gonna go forward. We're gonna introduce our panelists. Uh, on the extreme left uh, is Joe Sexton. Uh, he went from winning from an award-winning career at the New York Times to racking them up at Pro Politico. Po Publica, <laughs> uh, where given his reputation for salty expression, uh, he's generally read but not heard. 
Uh, Mary Wilson, in this crazy political environment, Mary G. Wilson is among those indispensable people who are dedicated to getting Americans to do what they should do without her help. Let's <laughs> vote. Uh, Scott Miller is a recipient of a Huffington Post Greatest Person of the Day Award. Uh, he's taken upon himself the task of inculcating the bedrock American values of entrepreneurship and risk-taking in Americans whose lives exist far from those activities. Marilinda Garcia is a Renaissance woman whose interests range from the head to the heart. She has a remarkable ability to absorb and utilize information from disparate sources. Um, however, after a reading about her, I'm left with a question, Mary Linda. Um, does heart playing offer a politician a key to the pearly gates? <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke that, um, well, first I think I'll have an advantage in heaven just because I am a harpist, but um, <laughs> apparently if you go to the other place, you're handed an accordion. So <laughs> 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 uh, Joe Sexton, uh, whose career at uh, ProPublica has been uh, one that has energized him to do some really wonderful things, and he wanted to lead off I think he's prepared for this, and he's going to challenge the rest of us. Go for it, Joe. Uh, thank you, um, and welcome. Um, actually, I, I don't know that I'll challenge anyone, but uh, what I have a particular uh, highly developed talent for is, is setting the bar low. Um, <laughs> so I'm all in on that, and you know, however, you, however excruciating the next couple of minutes are, just know in your heart it's going to get better. Uh, it can't help but. Um, the, uh, so I spent 25 years uh, at the New York Times, um, and I emerged, I, I, I describe myself as in recovery. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, but I, I guess I'm somewhat of, a, of an odd creature in that uh, across those 25 years, I, I had little appetite uh, for political coverage. Um, I had the pleasure and privilege of serving uh, as the head of two different departments, the Metropolitan Desk at the Times and the Sports Desk at the Times. Um, and my favorite acti and first urgent activity as Metropolitan Ed was to find somebody who would run our political coverage so that I wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, I, I never want to read another story about campaign finance and I, um, you know, uh, I, d I don't want to read about, uh, you know, the latest uh, polls. Um, but occasionally, there would be something would gain my attention. Um, there'd be a disruption or an outrage or a curiosity so great that um, I'd even pay attention to it. Um, and uh, Mike Bloomberg's bid for a third term as mayor of New York um, was a move so cynical and um, colossally uh, arrogant and anti-democratic that I thought, well, since I'm the Metropolitan Editor, maybe you know we should cover this thing. Um, <laughs> I, more by accident than design, I was the Metropolitan Editor when it became clear that our Governor Elliot Spitzer had a particular and insatiable appetite for um, call girls or prostitutes or, um, and you know uh, whether that was disgust or hilarity um, we managed to pay attention to that um, but when I went off to sports and then since I left the paper and, and moved to uh, ProPublica um, I, I've relished my lack of obligation to pay attention to politics but in the last six months, I think we can all recognize <laughs> there has been a disruption uh, or a curiosity um, of such uh, proportions that even Joe Sexton, who failed his radical Catholic feminist mother uh, and limousine liberal father so terribly by not caring about politics that much, 
uh, that it even has got my attention. And uh, so but the way I thought of framing what I might have to contribute uh, is either an enormous profundity, um, which I'm sure will register with you all and you'll break out in applause, uh, or it's one of the great clever cop-outs of all time, which is that it seems to me that if on a panel about what are the issues that, that matter in this election, uh, you could make an argument that there's really only one. Um, and that issue is, and here's my salty language, but wh who the fuck are we? Um, you know, the, uh, and it, you know, I, th I think here in Boulder, um, where I have not been, I, w I spent two misbegotten undergraduate years here and then uh, racked up a couple more actual felony convictions and credits. Um, <laughs> so, they so they asked me to leave. Um, so I have not been back in 37 years, but it, it <laughs> looking out at this audience, it hasn't changed all that much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it, it can be easy to, uh, uh, you know, deride um, uh, the existence and uh, success of Donald Trump. Um, it can be easy to, you know, run screaming from the room. Uh, but it has got my attention. I mean, the the what is going on? Who does he actually represent? Um, and, you know, we're obligated to take that seriously and think hard about it. And um, I had the blessing of, uh, of somebody forwarding to me a piece that I thought, you know, I had, I had kind of been waiting and disappointed in the New York Times, among others, to tell me or give me some guidance on you know, what the hell was going on. Um, but there was a wonderful, I thought a wonderful piece in a, uh, posted on Vox that was titled The Rise of American Authoritarianism. Um, so I'm just going to crib <laughs> shamelessly from that because I found it um, really clarifying to me, um, persuasive um, and disturbing all at once. Um, but that at least invited uh, us all to, to consider, um, you know, Donald Trump and, and his ascent um, as more than a, a, a sort of dark joke. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll do injustice to it, but it, it, it basically postulates that, you know, that an, a, a, a strain of American authoritarianism has been percolating um, underground, uh, misdiagnosed, underappreciated over the years, um, but that has been given um, uh, freedom to uh, assert itself. Uh, and that the, the motivating forces or the, um, or the triggers, as the author likes to say, are, you know, a, a, a sort of generalized appetite for order, um, a generalized fear of outsiders, um, and a desire to respond to those fears um, and that desire for order uh, with punishment. And, uh, you know, uh, there are some, the, the piece pulls together some numbers out of, out of South Carolina and again, South Carolina is not Boulder, um, but last I checked, it was still a part of the uh, 50 states. Um, and you know, the numbers, because I did some polling around the, the primary, 75% um, of Republican voters uh, in South Carolina supported banning Muslims from the United States, uh, a third, uh, supported banning gays and lesbians from the country. 20% said Lincoln shouldn't have freed the slaves. Um, 
again, it's, it's you know, the people to my right are, as many of you here are far more accomplished in processing that and understanding both the limits of what one is to make of that. Um, but God, it's, it seems hard to ignore. Um, and so in, in tracing uh, the sort of growth of, of this notion of American authoritarianism, uh, the author of the Vox piece went out and talked to some scholars who had been doing some good work on it over the last decade or so. Um, and one of the things that they had struggled with was, uh, so how do you get your hands around just how significant this is? Um, and, uh, you know, fascinating thing, fascinating even to a guy who, who uh, has little uh, interest in politics, they, they say, well, it's really hard to measure, you know, I mean, people's, uh, people aren't apt to respond to surveys, you know, um, list the, you know, the people you hate. Um, but in a, a really cool thing, what they, what they found, or a scholar did some number of years ago, um, was that the best way you could get at appreciating the American appetite for authoritarianism, for this idea of imposing order, of you know, uh, fearing outsiders, um, and of punishing those uh, who Wow, one minute left. I, I didn't know I even had nine minutes in me. Um, <laughs> but it's a good point that I, can, uh, that I can close on. So what they actually developed as a great tool for probing and uh, trying to understand the, the, the dimensions and reach of this was a survey about parenting. That this was the most revealing thing you could uh, you could ask of people to measure their appetite for authoritarianism. So it comes down to just four questions. Um, please tell me which one, which one you think is more important for a child to have, independence or respect for elders. Please tell me which one you think is more important for a child to have, obedience or self-reliance. Please tell me which one you think is more important for a child to have, to be considerate or to be well behaved. Please tell me which one you think is more important for a child to have, curiosity or good manners. And it, you know, it seems sort of simplistic or banal or crazy or whatever, but the answer to those questions do give a good guide about what you're seeking from your leaders. Um, and the idea that we, um, in Donald Trump's ascent, um, have put ourselves as children before the parent many of us seem to wish for is an arresting thought and one I thought we could begin with today. Thank you. Mary, just I, I am beginning to get questions up here, and as many of you know, uh, we give priority to students. So if you are a student and you are submitting a question, please make a note that you are a student, and we will call on you first. Mary, thank you. I'm going to answer uh, Joe's questions by saying all of the above. <laughs> uh, they're all pretty important uh, characteristics for all of us as well as for our elected officials. First thing I'm going to do is put a disclaimer in. Um, my background is with the League of Women Voters, but I am not speaking today on behalf of the League of Women Voters, and that's just a disclaimer in the event that I say something that could be interpreted as partisan. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't <laughs> usually intend to do that, but every once in a while uh, the ears hear it as a partisan kind of a comment. And I have to say that I approach this election issues uh, panel just a little bit differently from, uh, from Joe in the sense that, um, and that's probably my league background, um, I said, well, we're talking about substantive issues here, um, which is what we hope uh, that, uh, that all of you look at uh, when you go to the, when you 
are choosing elected officials and when you go into the voting booth, that you look truly at where elected officials stand on the issues. So I started by making a list of the potential issues. And after I got to 13 major issues with, you know, subsets of each one of them, I thought, well, I can't talk about all these issues. So the, the point that I'll start out at is that most of you come to the election process with one or two issues being personally impor most important to you. And that's great. Those are the issues that you care about. Those are the issues that you want to ask uh, candidates where they stand. Um, but you also, as informed and, and uh, uh, intelligent voters, want to be sure that you know where the elected officials and the candidates stand on each of, of the is important issues of the day. So that, for example, um, how we combat terrorism around the world might not be on your top uh, list. Um, a woman's right to choose might not be on your top list. But you do want to um, investigate, inform yourselves about where the candidates stand on all of the major issues. So I would suggest that um, as we get further into this election uh, process, and you know there's an election almost every year, whether it's for school board or uh, county uh, commissioner or whatever, so use this e every each and every election season, but we tend to focus on the presidential election uh, years. And so this is a good time uh, to really make that list of the major issues of the day that are important to you and um, think about those. Inform yourselves about those issues. Inform yourselves about where the candidates uh, stand on on those particular issues. And I'm sure that uh, all the panel members will be delighted to take questions on those substantive substantive issues and where we see the those substantive issues going this election season at least at the at the presidential um, level but um, the other part of of the election process that I always focus on as a good citizen we absolutely must be sure that every person who is eligible to vote can vote and I know it's not popular but the concept to me is that voting should be easy it shouldn't be a chore and so that's why um, we really and truly each of us has to pay attention to how easy it is for us to vote um, I know here in uh, in Colorado, uh, some of the elections have used uh, the uh, the paper mail-in uh, ballots, uh, and you would think you'd get a better uh, turnout response on that, but it usually doesn't happen. Uh, but um, we need uh, we need to make sure that the polls are accessible, um, that they're open for a long period of time, that there are enough. Uh, polling places where people can exercise their right to vote, whether that person is going to vote for the candidate of our choice uh, or someone that we think is absolutely, totally odious uh, and would never in the world vote for. Um, we as citizens must respect each other's opinions. We must understand why people um, choose the candidates that they do, and we must all make it easy to vote. And I have to say, we have already, in the primary process across the country, uh, seen some uh, voter uh, suppression, specifically in Phoenix, Arizona, where uh, the elected officials who were running um, the primary, uh, in, in a lot of the primary and caucus arenas, uh, the parties run those as opposed to the elected uh, government officials. But we've already seen um, what I would view as intentional um, voter suppression by compressing greatly the number of polling places at that primary by ab about 90%. Um, and 
Is there anyone in the room who thinks that in the, in the United States of America you should have to stand in line five hours to vote? Uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. And it is the responsibility of each and every one of us voters to make sure that that uh, does not happen. It's one of the reasons that I know that some people question the caucus uh, process and that the caucus process may be just a little bit disjointed uh, from, from the, w the process by which we uh, choose uh, the candidates during the primary uh, process. So you can argue about those processes all, all day long. But my message to you is um, make sure that you and all of your neighbors know about the issues that are on the ballot, know about the candidates uh, that you're going to be selecting uh, from, and that you have a good experience when you go to the polls uh, to vote. Thank you. still laughing about this joke about the accordion. My grandfather played the accordion, and, <laughs> and one of his favorite sayings, I'm so tired I have to lie down and go to hell. Is that <laughs> what he would say that all the time? Maybe he knew something. Uh, I went to school to become an architect. <coughs> I loved designing. I hated drawing. It wasn't a good fit, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to become an architect, and a friend of mine said, who was a Catholic priest one day, he said, why don't you go down to the local homeless shelter volunteer, get your mind off your mind, come up with something new. And I, I had to ask him, what was a homeless shelter? Raised in the burbs of Rochester, New York, uh, it's possible that you can be 18 and a half years old in this country as a baby boomer and never, ever have one conversation about poverty, ever, in church, in school, at your home, anywhere. So I drive all the way to the homeless shelter. That takes eight minutes from where I lived. And I am overwhelmed by the destitution that I see at, at this first. It was a, such a shocker to me. Um, so I kept volunteering at the homeless shelter. And I didn't really like college much. Nothing against, you know, that could be good for lots. For me, it was, the, what's the fastest way out of here? So I got a degree in business, organizational behavior, took all these sociology courses, went straight into social work like most people do, right? Get the degree in business, go over to social work. And I... <laughs> My first job interview, they said, listen, you have, uh, you're going to see, this was, I was so now I'm working for an agency that's working directly with people in poverty. Uh, and I, they said, you're going to see 40 people a week, and you have $1,000 to address their issues, which I'm, I thought was for every person. The cap was 1000 bucks, right? I'm from the burbs. No, that's the whole monthly budget, 40 a week. I'm not making this up. And I s distributed that money by Tuesday. I started on Thursday. It was gone by Tuesday. And... I had no place to refer people. No place, to, if you want to solve the problem that caused you to come in here needing financial assistance, I have no place to send you. That was in 1982. It hasn't changed in this country. The majority of trillions of dollars that are spent in the poverty management are just managing poverty. So <coughs> anyway, I, I, I found this group out in Iowa, and they, they had come to the conclusion that they had 110 different anti-poverty programs, and they were asking people, did we get you out of poverty? And the answer mostly was no. None of these programs helped. And they, and so, but maybe 10% got out of poverty over this five-year period of this informal surveying. Well, how did that happen? Well, I married somebody with a job. <laughs> you know, one job's better than none, and two's better than one. And so they really seriously, you know, as they were overwhelmed by the idea that the 110 strategies weren't adding up, we should just abandon this, create a dating service, and get on with what's really going to help here. <laughs> and it does cause you to wonder, like, what does it take to help people get out of poverty in this country? And first of all, there has to be an intent. So when I look at the, you know, what, what matters right now, I look at the fact that the country has about a 65% success rate with prosperity. And about 35% are not making it yet. So in a way, this country, it's, it's like being, you know, we're all going to live in the ocean, but we're not going to give you swimming lessons. The ocean of money. And we're not even going to start with the basics, like how does capitalism work? We see, uh, I work, uh, uh, so fast forward, we now have uh, projects called circles all over the country. 
And the purpose of these is to help 25 families out of poverty at least, and then teach the community what it takes to support 25 families completely out of poverty, no matter how long it takes. And we bring two volunteers to each family so that there's a relationship with middle and upper income folks, mainly for the purpose to raise their IQ about poverty so they can advocate more clearly about things. We have a chapter here in Boulder that's been going on for a while that the county actually sponsors. So <coughs> now the question to me is, how do you not be a whole network of lemonade stands that are these boutique programs getting 25 families? I mean, how do you seriously move it forward so it becomes a big time strategy? And we have decided that we're gonna go after reducing the poverty rate by 10% in at least 30 of our chapters in the next decade. Well, this causes me to think differently about everything. If you're trying to get the poverty rate to go down by 10%, you have to see that poverty is not just a humanitarian cause, it's an economic development imperative for many of our communities across the country. So I have been, um, now told by my conservative colleagues after listening to economic development strategy for the last five years that I'm a liberal with a conservative accent. And it seems useful to me because I can go into a community and talk to the director of the Chamber of Commerce and say this is why we need to reduce the poverty rate and they're getting it. That conversation is really easy now. So when I look at what matters in this election cycle, I'm thinking what are we doing about our economic base strategies? What you know, an economic-based job brings two service, roughly two service jobs into your town. And if you don't have money that's coming into your town from an economic-based job, good luck. It's hard to build out the economy. And if your economic development team has been dropped from five people to one person, how are you possibly going to get ahead of the curve on this? And so poverty just keeps building up, and all the agencies are out of their minds. Their hair is on fire downstream managing poverty. It feels really busy down there exhausting you know it's just but who's getting people out we're not going to do it nonprofits are not going to get there we're not going to solve poverty from the nonprofit sector alone so you have to have this economic development discussion so i think well what will the job market look like five years from now and let's build the what matters off of that is education in sync with that i mean some, my economic development friend who hikes with me up and down the Sandia Mountains in Albuquerque told me that the uh, 1099 job, it's about 39% of the job market right now is 1099s rather than W-2s. So th think about that. I mean, we're independent contractor. We're not in the W-2 warm fuzzy anymore, and it's going to go to 50%. So what do kids need to learn to be able to be in that environment? So more and more, I think, uh, the conversation should be on uh, preparing this next generation for door number one, two, or three, because we don't know which one's going to open up. But we definitely know that being able to move on your feet, teamwork, entrepreneurialism, being able to think out of the box, all the things that you mentioned, Joe, on the, uh, these characteristics that allow you to be ad adaptable, that's going to be the huge uh, thrust. And anything that doesn't move education in that direction is just hitting the delay button. And when it comes to um, the sustainability issues, how, are th how is this millennial group going to handle that? Because we, as baby boomers, are giving them a train wreck and a half. And we are putting our finger on the delay button at every, it's not even in the conversation with the, uh, uh, I don't hear it at all. I don't, it's crazy to me. Why do we have a full-time weather guy on the ABC News right now? Rex Devin, 53 million people are in the way of the new storm. This is every day. We're, and we're still not addressing those core issues. So to me, there's an intersection to solve poverty where 30% of the folks are trying to live on just enough to teach those who have more than enough that you've got to get your carbon footprint down. This world's got to get safer. We need to really focus on uh, making sure that we're not letting kids be uh, raised in poverty. And we've got to prepare them for who knows what. So I just listen to who's teaching adaptability, who's pushing that agenda at the national level. Where's that conversation going and why aren't we on the urgent issues and why are we so focused on the character of some of our nominees right now? And it, to me, it's just another delay, it's a delay switch. So anything that gets to the urgent present issues of the economy and the environment seem to me, those are the issues that matter and everything else is a delay.
now I feel like I should be giving a musical performance right now <laughs> instead of talking <laughs> about politics. But with thanks for your kind introduction, it's probably left most of you wondering why on earth I'm up here if I am, in fact, a harpist. Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit about uh, my path to being on this panel today. Um, I, I am a harpist. I Actually, my first career ambition was to be an orchestral harpist, and in pursuit of that, I attended a university and conservatory of music. I did a joint um, double degree program, and that's because I love music, but I had a lot of academic interests as well, so that was a way I could balance those. And uh, it was wonderful. Um, I, I really love playing in collaborative ensemble, and honestly, um, the opportunity that it afforded me to perform and travel all over the world um, is something you know that I never would have had any other way. Uh, my mother uh, came here from Italy. My father um, uh, came from New Mexico. He was had a turbulent upbringing. Was a foster kid, and then uh, just by virtue of studying and you know being a pretty smart guy, he got himself a scholarship to MIT um, and ended up in the East Coast. So um, my parents met there in Boston, and that's where I was born, and I've been in the area ever since. But in any case, um, the arts is difficult to make a career in, um, similar to sports and uh, other pursuits of the like, in that there are very few positions um, and then there are many people vying uh, for them. So with the harp, there's one uh, position in every major orchestra, and there's pretty much only one orchestra in every major city. And uh, you know, a harpist, perhaps because we provide our own therapy uh, <laughs> while we play, we tend to live long lives. So for example, my harp teacher was with the Boston Symphony for about 40 years, so there was clearly no position open there. And that's a similar story um, in Singapore, Ohio, wherever one would go. So anyway, I, after doing that for a while, um, when I was 23 years old, I was doing that and uh, working part-time and I, being just, I guess, a naturally busy person, I thought, what else could I be doing right now? And there were some midterm elections rolling around in 2006. And I thought, why don't I get involved in a campaign and uh, help out uh, someone who represents my values? at the time, and uh, I hadn't been in, this is in New Hampshire, I hadn't been in the state for a while, didn't even know who my representatives were at the time, so I called some people that I trusted and was asking around who's a good candidate, who, who can I help out, and someone suggested, why don't you run yourself? And so I thought very pragmatically, well, you know, there are very rudimentary aspects to campaigning, have to go shake hands, uh, come up with a platform, let people know where you stand on the issues, um, and you know, and then encourage them to vote for you. So I decided, instead of doing that for someone else, at least I know I represent my values. <laughs> so I'll just run myself. So anyway, I did, and I ended up winning um, a seat. And so I uh, served four terms in the New Hampshire legislature. And um, when I first arrived there, now. The, a few things about the New Hampshire legislature. It's actually the second largest uh, legislative body in the English-speaking world, with the exception of the U.S. Congress and Britain's Parliament. And um, the average age of the legislature is 62. So I was 23, and <laughs> I had been, again, playing the harp and you know performing, and um, and suddenly I found myself an elected representative and I thought what do I know um, <laughs> and what am I gonna do here and one of the things I've learned in life is that um, despite the way it may seem at the time when you enter any new uh, situation or challenge in fact there are many many skills uh, that you have either intrinsically or that you've acquired that are very transferable to the next endeavor you may take on and so I, I did find that to be the case, and uh, I'll just give one example. Um, because it's such a large um, assembly, there's 400 representatives, um, instead of everyone being as we are here, sitting in your chair with a microphone, you know, and you can kind of just beam in whenever you have something to say, if you want to address the House and 
advocate you know for a piece of legislation or issue you actually have to go to the well you know this very imposing stately uh, arrangement under portraits of you know Daniel Webster and you know other luminaries and then you have to address these uh, 400 other people um, and wouldn't you know uh, public speaking is actually one of the most common fears uh, out there and um, a lot of people would find that very um, a daunting prospect and so I found that this is way easier than playing a harp in front of <laughs> 400 people I just have to talk so um, I actually enjoyed it and took to it and uh, found that because of my I guess enthusiasm in doing so people be like well why don't you go speak why don't you go speak so I started to assume different uh, leadership um, roles and whatnot and so on and so forth anyway so after serving four terms I subsequently um, was going to uh, move on to other things. Um, I philosophically don't think that electoral politics ought to be a career, and I think, um, one, it distorts kind of the reason you run in the first place, and then, two, I think um, it's kind of silly because elections clearly are neither a science nor an art <laughs> in many ways. And so if you're relying on that to be your job, it's probably not a good idea. But um, Anyway, so I, I wasn't going to run again, but as these things work, you know, once you're involved, people look to you and, uh, you know, encourage you to take the next step, uh, as it were. And so I did end up running for Congress um, in my state, and I, and I was the nominee of my party. I did not win the general election. This was in 2014. Um, I was running against an incumbent um, congressperson uh, from the opposing party. But in any case, I did learn a lot about uh, politics and um, issues and, you know, what drives people and, you know, motivates them either to support you or to go out to the polls, donate, all of these things. And I'll tell you, um, coming to this panel and this topic, I will say it's very perplexing. This year has been perplexing because um, I think all of us, like to think uh, or understand how serious, um, in fact, elections are and the serious decisions that our elected officials make um, that affect really all of our lives. And by virtue of that, um, what happens in our states and by virtue of that, what happens in our country. And then since we are a global leader, um, we actually affect the entire trajectory of the world. And that's a very uh, humbling thing. And I would think of that often, um, you know, when making decisions on certain issues. But, um, but one of the things that you do then when you're running for office is you naturally think, I should be informed and really think through all of these important issues that even if they're maybe one year more popular or prominent than the next, there still are kind of the staples, right? There's education. People care about that. Jobs in the economy. People care about that health care, um, national security, all of these things. So um, what has been really interesting, and I, I don't, I, I think it's easy to blame, you know, look to assign blame. Um, you could say clearly Americans don't care, you know, or maybe people aren't doing their homework, or maybe it's the media's fault, um, and I will say it is hard. Again, it, when you're dealing with what are very complex issues, you end up in a campaign. And though on the one hand, people will hold it against you if you don't have, you know, a 50-page policy paper about, you know, all the nitty-gritty details of your, you know, tax reform plan or whatnot. On the other hand, nobody actually wants to hear that. If you actually start to uh, go out there and talk about those things, uh, people shut off, you know, in an instant. So you really do have to reduce everything to very simplistic concepts and then from there turn it into a 30 second soundbite um, to get your message across you have to be repetitive um, stay on message as they say and um, then you are subject to the fact that in in these days anyway um, journalism and entertainment uh, you know what is just driving ratings what is just acquiring clicks um, what's interesting uh, versus what's important. Um, it's, there's no question that um, 
the publicity and airtime that you get has less to do with how seriously you've thought through important things and what depth of knowledge you have uh, versus how catchy uh, something is that you say. So anyway, um, going forward to this election and the leaders that we have on both sides, on the one hand, you could think, really, this is the best America has to offer in terms of the presidency um, or a presidential candidate. Um, and on the other hand, you have to understand that I think humans um, the, the element of human nature is really important. And the fact is logic and facts are really not as important as emotions. Um, so you do have to connect and you do have to link in to a nerve, if you will. And I think that in the last few years, you know, there's all these complaints about gridlock and, you know, people saying one thing and doing the other and um, all of these issues. So all I can say is that it seems that um, people almost are saying, you know what, I don't care if we elect someone who says one thing one day and the next thing the other day. I don't care if he's offensive um, or impractical. Um, I just want things to be shaken up. I'm just tired of the way things are working or not working. And I just want a change in the most dramatic way. And I also think people um, on both sides feel as though they've been sort of bullied um, in terms of not fully being able to express what may frankly be <laughs> uh, negative and you know base forms of uh, human nature. But they there's that level, but then even on the level above that, they feel as though they really can't speak their minds and you know be who they are. So they almost like the fact that um, there are people running for the presidency that kind of blow those doors so wide open that it leave it ma almost makes them feel safe um, in terms of um, you know issues they care about and how they want to live. So I, I think we're seeing something remarkable. I think issues still do matter. But I think we've definitely had a uh, paradigm shift in the way elections are not necessarily true expressions of what are the important issues of the day. They're more of an expression of what is the uh, sort of emotional temperature of the country. And I'll just cut it off there. <laughs> In the, in the normal course of events, we uh, give the panelists an opportunity to speak with each other after their initial comments. Uh, we've had so many questions. I think I'm going to forego that and go to the questions. Uh, one uh, additional comment on the questions. When you're sending them in, uh, this thing has sort of a Twitter mentality. It likes very short questions. Uh, and if they're too long, I only get part of them. So kind of keep kind of keep them short when you're sending them in. Uh, there are also uh, a number of questions related to a few subjects. So I'm going to make an attempt to kind of combine them uh, so that we can get the most covered. And and the uh, actually the very first question that came in uh, was, uh, do you do the panelists think? Uh, this is an election uh, primarily dominated by social issues. But there was another question that came in much later, which was, why isn't there more conversation about global warming, which is the predominant issue, at least in the questioner's mind, facing the country today? So this is sort of two sides to the same, same coin. Uh, who would like to go first? Joe, would you like to go first? Well, uh, I'm, yeah, again, yeah, I, I've already maxed out my very limited ability to sound coherent. The, um, but it does, you know, uh, if, the, uh, if the Trump phenomenon is representative at some essential level of uh, the way in which fear uh, can drive uh, discussions and fear can drive uh, elections, uh, 
um, as a 56-year-old father of five-year-old twins, um, I'm vulnerable to scares myself. Um, and the thing that frightens me most uh, is the question of, of global warming, of climate change. Um, the, uh, but it doesn't obviously, um, is not particularly well suited to, um, you know, the American political <coughs> system, which, you know, when you can't manage to, you know, uh, take the smallest step forward, how can we reasonably, uh, believe that people will actually, you know, consider the, the fate of things in a hundred years or 50 years. Or um, so uh, it on one level, it, it doesn't make sense why something that fundamentally frightening, uh, that fundamentally far-reaching uh, should not have a greater uh, profile in the discussion. But you know, I, I d you know, I, I think I am echoing a couple other panelists. The, the, the I, I just think the the general reasonableness of the conversation, the general uh, specificity of the issues, has been completely shattered, um, and there really is, a, you know, uh, th the emotional temperature um, seems. Uh, so white hot um, that uh, to expect a uh, specific, principled, thoughtful, forward-looking discussion of an issue like climate change is just an absolute non-starter. Um, I'd like to uh, address, first of all, the question of uh, why do we think that social issues are going to dominate this election? Um, during the primary season, we certainly have seen uh, some of the social uh, issues, especially the wage disparity uh, kinds of issues and the poverty uh, issues uh, that uh, Scott has talked about being discussed a lot. But I, from my perspective, I see that more as a function of uh, particular candidates and that uh, uh, the louder the message on that issue from, from a particular candidate, the more we're going to perceive that the social issues are going to dominate the whole election. Remember, we're only in the primary season, and so as we get uh, into the general election season after the parties have chosen their, nom their respective nominees, um, we're going to be seeing a broader range of discussion. Clearly, we're going to be seeing more on, on the question of combating terrorism around the world uh, and foreign policy kinds uh, of issues. So um, the, the emphasis that we're seeing now on social issues may, may turn around and, and it may be broader. But I also want to tell you that you have the power you have the power to change what the discussion is in an election year. And if you think that climate change issues are to be discussed on the national level a whole, a whole lot more, make your voices known in every possible way that you can. Um, talk about this issue more. We want to know where you stand on this particular issue because if you don't, especially on that climate change uh, issue, uh oh, I'm, I'm acting like one of the candidates with my finger pointing here. Uh, <laughs> um, if Lovely you long fingers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should play the harp. Hard hands. Uh, If, if you don't make your voices known that that climate change issue is important, that is going to get a, lo a lower focus because we have what's going on in this country, what I call the dumbing down of America. And uh, people don't understand science. And a lot of the voters out there are uh, climate deniers, if you will. And so 
the at the national level you're not going to see necessarily those of us who support doing things now uh, to prevent our children and grandchildren from suffering the effects of climate change um, you're, you're not going to see that dialogue being sparked by the candidates themselves because they know that amongst the voters out there, there are a lot of climate deniers. So raise your voices and change the dialogue. I don't know if any of you... <laughs> if you've ever been raised or had a relative who became an alcoholic, uh, if you've been raised in a family like that. It's interesting because nobody talks about the issue. That's kind of a characteristic of supporting and enabling alcoholism, right? You never talk about those issues. Even when one of my relatives got into recovery, we still never talked about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought, when you asked this question, I thought, well, the baby boomers have been addicts on buying stuff, traveling, carbon footprint. We just can't help ourselves. We're so addicted to consuming at the level that we're used to consuming at. And so when you look at the candidates, baby boomers, and you look at who's financing them, more baby boomers, you know, it makes sense to me that we're just all colluding in this denial about the situation. So it's hard to imagine, unless millennials who are not in this uh, particular addiction, w unless their leadership comes forward and says, enough's enough, we're going to keep on denying this climate thing uh, until the cows come home, because we're not willing to address it personally. I mean, how many of us have ever gone online and put, you know, that uh, carbon footprint calculator. Mm -hmm. I can't get, un my lifestyle cannot get under three planets worth just because I live in the U.S. No matter what I do, I cannot get it to come down to three planets that it would take to sustain my lifestyle. And because I hop on a plane, forget it. You know, I, my footprint's Godzilla. And so I can't, I don't see us changing that until the baby boomers are challenged by the next generation that is going to have even more of the challenge uh, around the sustainability issue. say that um, a lot of times it seems, uh, and I, I again would see this in campaigns and whatnot, people would be like, oh, you know, I'm all about economic issues, I'm not about social issues, or vice versa. But in fact, I think they're conflated. I think social issues and economic issues go hand in hand. Um, you can look at it a few different ways. On the one hand, you can look at, so we talk about, for example, income inequality, right? That sounds like an economic issue, but in fact, what do they say the root causes of these disparity disparities in our society are? They're uh, the prevalence of, uh, for example, you see the, the rates of kids that don't get a good education, that come from um, fragmented families, they end up with uh, higher dropout rates, higher incarceration rates, which then feeds them into a lifestyle where they're unlikely to climb out from that and go up the socioeconomic ladder. So there's, you know, an issue that's both social and economic. Then even when you talk about the most contentious ones, for example, uh, climate change and abortion, let's say, nobody is really out there arguing, um, let's say, on the like she mentioned, uh, climate deniers, let's say. Um, nobody's really out there saying climate change doesn't happen. The real essence of the debate is it's happening, but what is the cause and what do we do about it? Well, guess what? The solutions that are put forward have to do with economic issues. It's carbon taxes. It's, you know, raising uh, electricity rates and, you know, wattage issues, all of these things. So that's tied together. And again, on abortion, nobody was out there saying, let's ban this and overturn Roe v. Wade. The biggest debate we had about abortion in the last year was about taxpayer funding for um, Planned Parenthood um, and basically being forced to subsidize uh, a practice that um, many Americans don't agree with. So I think they go hand in hand and you can't actually separate them. And now in an age where, um, in for example, in social media and whatnot, there's a, a big uh, concern amongst I'm a millennial, um, you know, people of my generation where, you know, you talk about the reality of life and then the perception of your life. And, you know, when it comes to these people that are devoted to Instagram and Facebook and whatnot, they've done studies that show um, 
higher rates of dissatisfaction with oneself, with one's lifestyle, with one's economic status, and that's because everyone's kind of showing off their highlight reel and trying to present themselves as living this, you know, fabulous, fast-paced, glamorous lifestyle. And, you know, that relates, that's a social issue in terms of social perception, but it also comes in an economic packaging where everyone kind of wants to show that they're maybe at a different place in their job and, you know, and sort of their uh, progression into adulthood and uh, success, if you will, than um, is necessarily the case. So I think they all go hand in hand right now and you can't kind of just separate them. We've had a, uh, a couple of questions uh, that deal with voting. So I'll, I'll, I'll read both of them but quickly. Uh, what are the benefits of implementing a voter ID process and the other is, how can we combat voter suppression when most civil rights protections were thrown out by the Supreme Court last year? Uh, who, would like to, who would like to take the first shot at that? I'll take the first shot at that one. I thought you might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the uh, last part of that question is, is a very challenging thing, and um, it's quite true that with the um, uh, provisions of uh, pre-clearance notification to the Department of Justice under the Voting Rights Act uh, being thrown out in a lot of the states. That's, it seems as if that's a direct cause of what uh, was allowed to happen in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And so that is a great concern uh, to us. And um, each and of every one of us uh, needs to be aware um, before the election happens that uh, the Department of Justice is no longer overseeing in some of those critical areas um, the, um, the, the, the right to, uh, to have enough polling places and any changes in the, in the voting process. Uh, so it is, it's, a very, it's a very challenging effort. League of Women Voters is, is on uh, onto that issue. Uh, we've been lobbying quite actively uh, with respect uh, to, to that issue. And I'm happy to say that the Department of Justice uh, is actually looking into and investigating, even though they don't have the uh, preclearance authority, they're looking after the fact. And so we're probably fortunate that the thing in Arizona did happen because that, that will um, hopefully put the fear of God in all of the other uh, jurisdictions that the Department of Justice, uh, maybe you don't have to send it through for preclearance, but they're gonna look at you uh, afterwards. Um, and so that's, that's the most hope uh, that, I can, that I can offer at this uh, particular point in time on, uh, on that issue. The, uh, if a, because I'm a heretic by disposition, whatever, let me commit a heresy and, and see if I can draw the moderator into the conversation. Because um, uh, I've had the pleasure of, of, of staying with uh, Alan and Stephanie uh, as their guests. Uh, and Alan uh, is both a wonderful host and uh, has a wonderful mind. And I know that if he were a panelist rather than a moderator, and he were asked the question, what's the single most important issue in this year's election? Um, he has a ready answer, and it sort of might be well-timed here because, um, you know, whether it is uh, uh, climate change, right? One of Antonin Scalia's great and lasting uh, contributions uh, to our welfare um, was to, you know, be part of a majority that killed Obama's you know, <coughs> emissions legislation. Um, and, you know, if we're asking questions about voter suppression and the eradication of the Voting Rights Act and whatever, you have the Supreme Court having played, uh, obviously, a decisive role in that. So, Alan, you want to talk about your favorite issue? I'm likely to get fired or banished. Or <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm a one-issue voter. And my issue is the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a really interesting 
question. We've, we've only got a very few minutes, like 10. Oh, and, and before we get to it, as you're walking out, those of you uh, who are using this texting process, um, please text in the word leave or you will be forever connected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the question is, um, are, are we at risk of uh, becoming uh, two Americas? Is, is this election accelerating and exacerbating the move to two different nations within the United States? Yes. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've been on this track for 40 years. And I think the have and have not split is so profound that I know the group that I work with across the country is in what I would just uh, easily, s you could just call it the tyranny of the moment. So they're not gonna have an easy time voting if it takes effort away from having two to three jobs and raising mm -hmm. kids in poverty. It's mm -hmm. just not gonna happen. And yet they're gonna be affected first and foremost by what policies happen economically and politically in this country. So th those who have the most stake in what's happening next are gonna be the least likely to be able uh, to feel they can do something about that. And so it creates a disempowerment at another level, and another level. And, that, and, and that's one way to divide up the two Americas. The, the interesting thing about um, you know, the piece I was talking about on, on uh, the rise of American authoritarianism is that, you know, that, uh, that offers you another way to, uh, to appreciate two Americas. And the question that it invites is just how big is what I think most of us here in this room would regard as that other America. And one of the innumerable confounding things about Trump and his popularity is that it has cut across a, a, a weird and extraordinary uh, assortment of uh, of um, you know demographics uh, a, a across class in interesting ways, but also across you know uh, Democrat and Republican lines that you would have thought you know would have been unthinkable, um, and so you know for me I, I have no doubt that there are two Americas. Um, I just think this particular election cycle has has provoked a question of like um, just how sizable is the other um, because it might be much more sizable than many of us in this room would care to think or believe. I would also say yes, but with the addendum that I don't think it's necessarily something of permanence in that um, one thing I think in terms of issues and politics and parties and all of that, everything is cyclical, um, depending on what are the things that concern us. You know, at the time, many I in many instances, things we could never predict. Um, so, for example, it was always, oh, you know, the Republicans are the party of national security and this, that, and the other. And then, wouldn't you know, that changed. Um, and then, um, so I, I actually was, and. I don't necessarily like to talk about these things because they seem a little scary even to me, but I do work in uh, cybersecurity um, on the policy side. And so um, I was happy to hear, uh, if you attended the uh, keynote last night, Mr. Wozniak kind of give voice to <laughs> some of my uh, concerns in that going into the future, frankly, we don't know what's gonna happen. And um, when you look at the integration of technology in our society right now and how um, much we really depend and increasingly so everything is frankly on a grid and whatnot. If, um, uh, God forbid, there be some sort of large disaster or attack, you know, we'll all be reduced to a certain <laughs> level of, uh, just things will be different. Things will be quite different and I think the paradigm will change and, uh, but you know, hopefully that would not be the case, but otherwise I think with the advance again of technology, which is a great equalizer in many respects, and then uh, the integration of, uh, you know, AI and robots and all of this, I, I say who knows what's gonna happen. So even though as of right now, um, based on the issues and information and situation we're in right now, sure, you can say we're divided and there's two Americas and whatnot, I don't think that's necessarily something that has to be always the case. And I, I just want to take care um, that in, you know, in sort of 
postulating what uh, my two Americans thought and what Trump's uh, sentiment. Uh, uh, by no means am I, uh, you know, uh, endorsing the idea that you know there is some hateful other half um, that we should sit in, you know, scary judgment of. Uh, if there is that other half that, you know, uh, at least the, the the Vox piece I thought, um, you know, persuasively uh, uh, floated, uh, we're, uh, we're obligated to understand that, um, you know, uh, any you know uh, efforts against two Americas has to begin from the basic idea that the that other America is in fact us. And you know what? What is driving that fear? What has been unanswered about their anger? Um, what you know uh, can be done to you know uh, limit the that uh, some appetite for um, rather than solutions, punishment. Uh, that you know. So uh, anyway, I, I I don't mean in any way to contribute to the polarization by saying there's us and there's this room and there's the, the other half. That other half is deserving of respect and understanding. Let me uh, close the comments on this one by saying I was born and raised in Appalachia. There always has been two Americas. And thank God we're finally focusing on that. <laughs> Amen. Perfect. Thank you. It's been a wonderful morning. Appreciate your participation.